Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 274, McManus on Oneness Pentecostal Christology. In this episode of the Trinity's Podcast, I'm going to be interacting with a really excellent blog post that was done back in February 2019 by a young man named Skylar McManus. I don't know Mr. McManus, I've never met him, but I can tell from his blog that he's a very serious student and a very clear thinker. He's completed a bachelor's degree from the University of Washington in History and Philosophy, and I believe he's in the process of finishing up his master's degree in Theological Studies and Biblical Studies at Regent University. His blog is called Thought Life, and you can find it at SkylarMcManus.com, S-K-Y, Sky, L-A-R, McManus, M-C-M-A-N-U-S.com. I recommend it. There are a lot of interesting posts there. Mr. McManus's background is oneness Pentecostalism. I'm not quite sure what his view now is. It's clear to me that he's learning a lot about what you could call classical or mainstream small c Catholic theological traditions about God and Christ, and he's impressed with their sophistication and the way that they're trying to answer objections. And I think he's in his mind contrasting these with oneness theology, which tends to be less developed. I'm not sure if he really thinks at the end of the day that oneness theology and Christology makes sense or makes the best sense of the Bible. But, you know, it really doesn't matter. He's interacting in a really interesting way with an older blog post of mine, and I think you'll find this interesting. And the reason I decided to do this episode now is because he's interacting with the first book by Dr. Timothy Paul, who you heard in the two previous episodes. So he finds some help there for, he thinks, oneness Christology. So let me just jump right into it now. His blog post is entitled, A Solution to Dale Tuggy's Argument Against Oneness Pentecostal Christology. And again, that's a blog post from February 4th, 2019. He's referring back to a post I did way back in 2006 called An Argument Against Sun Modalism. I'll repost it after this episode. I'll make sure it's formatted correctly and update it, uh, but I won't change any of the content to it because he's referring to it here. So I'll read through Mr. McManus's blog post and give some thoughts in response to it. He writes, A number of years ago, I discovered Dr. Dale Tuggy's website, and I ran into an argument that turned me agnostic about my views about God and Jesus. At the time, I was a oneness Pentecostal, so I held to the view that Jesus is the Father incarnate. Back then, I was a history and philosophy student at the University of Washington, Thanks to some conversations with a professor in a philosophy of religion class, I started to gain interest in what analytic philosophers and theologians were saying about the Trinity and the Incarnation. I think I first ran into Tuggy's website by searching for William Lane Craig's view of the Trinity, sometimes called Trinity monotheism, and I quickly ran into a series of posts Tuggy wrote on modalism. What he appreciated about Tuggy's posts was that he first sought to clarify what modalism claims— and afterward try to offer an argument against certain kinds of modalism. Oneness Pentecostals don't typically accept the term modalism because writers often use that term as a synonym for Sabellianism. As I have explained in a recent paper, Oneness Pentecostals aren't Sabellians. Let me just pause for a moment and explain this little bit of standard theological terminology. Sibelius is this completely obscure early figure and who knows what he really thought, but what they said about him in like the 3rd, 4th, and 5th century and beyond was that he held that first God was Father, and then he became Son in the Incarnation, and then I guess at the ascension of Jesus, he became Spirit. So there's one God who is Father, Son, and Spirit, but he is these things serially, and it seems that then these, quote, persons of the Trinity would just be three stages of God's life or three ways that God lives or three ways that God interacts with creation or something like that. In theological terminology, Sibelianism is just kind of, by definition, heretical and wrong. It's not always clear why Sibelianism is wrong or quite exactly how it differs from a lot of people's understanding of the Trinity, unless it's just that the members of the Trinity are eternally concurrent, uh, that they're not one after the other, but they're always overlapping. 
either timelessly or at all times. Anyway, at the time I was using modalism for any sort of view where one or more persons of the Trinity turn out to be modes of God, which is to say ways God is. My conception of a way God is, is flexible. If you're talking about an event or a fact such as God being loving, that could be a mode of God. That's a way that God is. That would just be God having an intrinsic property. Unless you mean loving another, then it would be a relation between God and something else. So a mode could be wholly intrinsic, or it could be something that also involves other things. It could be thought of as a fact or an event, or just a property of the thing. But when you're talking about modalism with respect to the Trinity, I think the point of it is that you're trying to keep the number of gods down. And you think that, well, a God is just a super duper self, like a self which is all knowing, all powerful, and completely morally good, and surely some other things as well. And so you don't want multiple of those in the Trinity, because that would be multiple gods. So what you do is you demote one or two or three of the persons to just being ways this one divine person is. And in this way, you avoid polytheism or ditheism or tritheism. Um, so that's kind of the point of what I was calling modalism here. I've since repented of using the term modalism. It just sets too many people off on a wrong track. I would say, let the theologians have the term modalism. I don't care about the term. Most people who I would have earlier described as modalists are what I would now call oneself Trinitarians. And the way they get oneself out of what look like three selves is that they reduce some of those selves down to just modes of the one divine self. And there's different ways that can work, but I, I shouldn't go into it now. I don't talk about modalism like this anymore because it's a distraction for people with theological education, but I can paraphrase everything that I say using the word modalism just in terms of uh, oneself views about the Trinity or about God and Jesus. Okay, so oneness Pentecostals aren't Sibelians because they have the Father and Son existing at the same time during, say, the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus. They think he's the Father and the Son. He continues, regardless, the argument Tuggy offered applies to oneness Pentecostal Christology. Right, he's smart enough not to get just hung up on the terminology, but to pay attention to the substance of what's actually being said. He says, in this post, I'm going to share the argument and provide what I think is the most plausible way for the oneness Pentecostal to avoid it. Okay, so he's exploring here. He's not committing to oneness views about Jesus and God here, but he's saying, well, couldn't they answer this argument pretty easily if they just bring in some machinery from more mainstream thinking about Christology? That's kind of the thrust of this. I think Mr. McManus isn't realizing the full cost of some of these moves that are brought in from mainstream Catholic and Protestant thinking. He continues, he says, here is the argument that Tuggy offers against any type of modalism about the sun. Okay, so this is a quote from my old blog post. Premise one, suppose that modalism is true about the sun. Premise two, therefore, either the sun is identical to God or the sun is a mode of God. 3. The Son is identical to God only if whatever is true of God is true of the Son, and vice versa. 4. Some things are true of God which are not true of the Son, and vice versa. 5. Therefore, the Son is not identical to God. That follows from 3 and 4. 6. If the Son is a mode of God, then the Son at no time has a loving interpersonal relationship with God. That's another premise. 7. The Son has had a loving interpersonal relationship with God. That's a premise. 8. Therefore, the Son is not a mode of God. That follows from 6 and 7. And then step 9. Therefore, modalism about the Son is false. The Son is not a mode of God. That follows from 2, 5, and 8. So basically, it's a destructive dilemma. If he's a mode of God, you mean either that he's just God himself, that they're numerically identical, but in that case, they differ. That can't be right. One and the same thing can at one time differ from itself. That's obviously impossible. But if you mean the Son is not identical to God himself, but instead is a mode of God himself, like a way that God is, okay, but God and the Son have an interpersonal, which is to say a self-to-self -self relationship that requires that they are two different selves. 
And you can't have a mode of thing literally entering into friendship with a self. It, it makes no sense. You couldn't say that Dale is friends with husband Dale. There aren't enough beings there for there to be an interpersonal relationship, right? Where you could say husband Dale can't be friends with employee Dale. I mean, they're both just Dale. You can say they're two different things, but they're just two different modes. There's really one thing, one being, one thinking thing between those two modes. So we haven't switched subjects talking about different things, although we can distinguish different aspects of mind, different properties of mind, different relations that I enter into with different things. But it's all just about me, right? Okay. Just to give you a spoiler, he's going to deny premise four, that some things are true of God, which are not true of the Son, and vice versa. He's going to deny that. So no, whatever's true of God is true of the Son, and vice versa. Oh, okay. Gee, that seems like a hard way to go. Let me continue with his explanation of my argument. He says, As you can see, there are nine steps in this argument. Each step that begins with the word therefore is a conclusion, and all the others are premises. After each conclusion are parentheses and step numbers that tell you how that conclusion is reached. These conclusions are derived deductively, which means that if the premises cited are true, the conclusion must also be true. Obviously, step nine is a problem for oneness Christology. In other words, if the Son can't be a mode of God, then oneness Christology is false because they say the Son is a mode of God. The Son is a way that God is. To get out of the argument, he says, we have to deny a step in the argument. It's a matter of procedure. We can't object to any of the conclusions directly. That is, in order to avoid steps 5, 8, and 9, the conclusions, we have to object to the premises that support them, which are premises 3, 4, 6, or 7. Premise 2 is an interesting case because Tuggy claims it's true by definition. I actually think there are more options than he lists, but I'm going to grant it for present purposes. We also can't deny premise 1 because it's what the oneness Pentecostal claims about Christ, minus the terminological dispute I mentioned above, he means about the term modalism, and because it's what we're assuming for the sake of argument. Right, so again, steps one and two are suppose that modalism is true about the Son. We're supposing that in order to refute it, to show that it leads to unacceptable consequences. So it's pointless to deny one. Two is just supposed to be definitional of what we mean by modalism. Either the Son just is God himself, that they're numerically identical, or the Son is a mode of God. I don't know what Mr. McManus is referring to for other options here. I mean, maybe he would be good enough to chime in with a comment on the blog post for this episode and let us know what he's thinking. That would be wonderful. But for the sake of argument, he's going to grant those things. He says, you'll want to read Tuggy's post about the argument to see justification for each step. But in his view, the only clear way out of the argument is to deny six, which to his mind is implausible. Yeah, I mean, I discussed that for the sake of argument, but really, I don't think there is a good way out of the argument. I just think it's a sound argument. I think it really is a pretty solid refutation of saying that the Son is a mode of God. Now he refers to a oneness writer who he's familiar with. Jason Dull's Christology doesn't allow for this sort of dodge, since he thinks that the term Son refers to a way that the one God is conscious of himself, that is, Son does not refer to a divine person, but rather to a way a divine person, i.e. God, has experiences through his assumed human nature. If this is the route one wants to go, it looks like six is probably true by definition. Yeah, I mean, I think six is self-evident. I'm not sure if it's exactly true by the definition of mode or the definitions of mode and loving interpersonal relationship, but... He continues, I don't think anybody who takes the New Testament seriously should deny seven, which is that the Son has a loving interpersonal relationship with God. Right, you can just see that in the Gospels. He continues, but as I've argued elsewhere, there are other problems with taking Dull's approach. Denying six is a bust, in my view. I agree. Tuggy also says that this is just about as close to a knockdown argument for a view that you can find. But is that the case? For a long time I thought so, but now I think oneness Pentecostals should deny four. Again, that some things are true of God which are not true of the Son and vice versa. So in other words, anything true of God is true of the Son and anything true of the Son is true of God. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Mr. McManus decides to use some material from our most recent guest on the Trinity's podcast.
The next portion of his article, his blog post, he calls Paul's Repost. He writes, in response to Tuggy's advance, I will repost with some clarifications from Timothy Paul's book, In Defense of Conciliar Christology, and an essay of his from the Journal of Analytic Theology. Tuggy has actually interviewed Paul about his book, and I recommend it to readers as well. Paul's basic view boils down to this. Certain predicates, in other words, descriptive terms, that are apt or true of a thing aren't really incompatible for a two-natured subject. For example, you might think that one and the same subject can't be both unchangeable and changeable. Unchangeable just means not changeable, so how can one and the same thing be both changeable and not changeable? Isn't that a contradiction? Paul would concede that this is a contradiction if these are the truth conditions we want to use for the terms changeable and unchangeable. So he calls these definitions changeable A and unchangeable A. Changeable A definition is a subject S is changeable if and only if it is possible that S change in some way. The definition unchangeable A is a subject S is unchangeable if and only if it is not possible that S change in some way. If we want to understand changeable and unchangeable in these absolute ways, then obviously we're going to come away thinking one and the same subject can't be both. The same subject cannot both possibly change and not possibly change. Or, this is back to me now, one the same being can't be capable of change and not at the same time in the same sense. He continues, But what if we understand changeable and unchangeable in different ways so that the terms aren't incompatible at all? Here's a suggestion, and he calls these two definitions changeable n and unchangeable n. Changeable n says, a subject S is changeable if and only if S has a nature that can possibly change in some way. Definition unchangeable n is, a subject S is unchangeable if and only if S has a nature that cannot possibly change in some way. I think he means cannot possibly change in any way. Now consider the incarnate Christ who has two natures. Is it true to say that Christ is changeable? Yes, for on changeable n, Christ has a nature, his concrete human nature, that can change. Is it also true to say that Christ is unchangeable? Again, yes, he also has a nature, his divine nature, that cannot possibly change in some way. In other words, in any way. So, both changeable and unchangeable are predicates that are apt of Christ on changeable n and unchangeable n. What I'm calling Paul's repost is essentially the has a nature that locution in the revised truth conditions. Let me pause here and paraphrase what just happened. Dr. Paul argues that if you read some of these early theologians, early as in like 4th and 5th century theologians, and they say things like Christ is changeable and unchangeable, Surely you don't want to say that they're asserting something that they think is incoherent. Right, right. They're not dumb. So they must understand changeable and unchangeable, those two predicates, those two terms, in ways that are compatible so that one doesn't rule the other one out. And one way that could be is just changeable means, in this case, that you have a nature that can change, and unchangeable means you have a nature that can't change. And so one the same thing, if it has more than one nature, might be both changeable and unchangeable, and so those terms are compatible after all. So the key move is really in terms of definitions. We should take these apparently incompatible predicates and define them so they're compatible. The whole strategy is only going to work if there is sufficient motivation for doing this other than just that, it, hey, it would save my theory. And one motivation is, hey, these guys weren't dumb. They charged their enemies with being incoherent, so clearly they don't want to be incoherent. Uh, yeah, they don't want to be, although they're pretty big into mystery and playing up apparent paradox. And when somebody's a mysterian, that can and typically does involve embracing apparent contradictions. And I have other concerns about this Paul move, but we'll talk about those below. Let's see how Mr. McManus applies what he calls Paul's repost to this issue, to this argument of mine. He says, now, how does Paul's repost apply to denying premise four of Tuggy's argument? Basically like this, if the oneness Pentecostal adopts a Model T concrete compositional Christology, 
it is strictly speaking false that, subsequent to the incarnation, there are predicates apt of the Father that are not apt of the Son. On a Model T view, the divine person who is incarnate just is the Son. Son here refers to the incarnation in its entirety. The divine person who is incarnate plus the concrete human parts assumed plus the relations between them. To the oneness Pentecostal, this means that the Father is a composite person subsequent to the incarnation. The Father incarnate just is the Son. I'll immediately admit that this gives us some really odd-sounding truth conditions on oneness Christology. I think that this counts against the plausibility of the solution, but not against its possibility. Now I'll explain what I mean here. Well, before we let him do that, let me pause and explain some more terminology here. He's talking about theories on which Jesus has a human nature. He's talking about concrete views. So the human nature isn't just an abstract set of properties. They're not just saying that Christ has all the properties it takes to be divine and all the properties that are implied by being human. But they're saying that there are things there. The human nature is an individual thing. It's a concrete thing, a thing with causal powers and that could be affected causally. It's not just a property or an abstraction or a concept or anything like that. Dr. Paul also thinks that, hey, this is just what the tradition says. Uh, modern people that want to take the divine and the human nature just to be properties, that's just wrong. They're two different things. I think he's right about that, but we won't go into his historical theological reasons for that. The term Model T comes from an article by a very good Roman Catholic philosopher uh, who's also a very uh, all-around good guy. I've met him a couple times, Dr. Thomas Flint of the University of Notre Dame. He uses T for Thomas, like St. Thomas Aquinas, in modern times the favorite Roman Catholic philosopher theologian. Basically, what he calls a Model T view is just incarnation as part addition. So, first you have the Word existing, and that just is Christ. That's the same person as the Son of God, this Logos, the Word. And then when he becomes incarnate, he gains a part, and that part is Christ's human nature. So, a body and a rational soul, those together make a human nature, a complete human nature. And when the incarnation happens, this previously existing person slash being, the Word, just grows. He adds a part to himself. And now that whole thing is Christ. So Christ, or the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, has one part at time one. And at time two, once the incarnation happens, he's got two parts, the divine nature, that is the Word, and now a complete human nature viewed as a part. He contrasts this with an A model. On the A model, at time one, you have the Word, and at time two, you have the Word, which is entered into some kind of unity with a complete human nature, but this human nature is not supposed to be a part of the Son. Now, a question I think you should ask for either one of these views is, why on earth would you think that that makes this eternal divine Word truly human? Suppose some mad scientist could implant the embryo of, I don't know, a mouse into you. So for the first moment of this mouse embryo's existence, it's implanted, I don't know, in your shoulder. And then you have this mouse growing out of your shoulder. And it has all the parts a mouse would normally have, body and mouse soul, if you believe in mouse souls. And let's just specify that it counts as a part of you. That wouldn't make you a mouse man, right? That would make you a human being who has a mouse as a part, or a mouse nature, if you like, as a part, if that thing doesn't count as a mouse. So it's not clear that parthood helps. It's not clear that this mysterious assumption relationship adds anything at all to the mix. Why would you think that this mysterious relationship means that the assumer now is what this other nature is? So why is it that, quote, assuming a complete human nature makes one truly human? Why aren't you just now a god or a divine person who also is in this mysterious relationship with a complete human nature? Maybe they even act through it or experience the world through it. Again, it's not clear that should count as making them human. Even if we add in that the mouse nature subsists or exists as a substance because of the one on whose shoulder the mouse nature 
is, why should that make the bearer, the original person, a mouse man? It looks like it doesn't. It looks like it makes him a man. Oh, and also he's got this mouse as a part. So there's always a worry about docetism when it comes to two natures theory. There's a lot of assuming that having the components that would normally go together to make a human person makes the logos or the word human in the appropriate sense, but it's far from clear that that's so. Okay, but let's set that aside and continue on. So applied to oneness views, you have the father slash son. That's one person and one being, and he decides to become human. And so this father-son adds a complete human nature to himself as a part, and now you call that whole thing, that whole composite being with two parts, the divine nature and the human nature, you call that whole thing the son, or equally well, you could call it the father, because they're just one and the same. So what Mr. McManus does now is he considers what I have said in favor of premise four. This is the premise that he says the oneness Pentecostal should deny. Premise four is, Some things are true of God, which are not true of the Son, and vice versa. I think that's obviously true and something that any Christian is committed to. And it doesn't matter whether God here refers to the Trinity or to the Father. If God refers to the Trinity, then you can say God is tripersonal and Christ is not tripersonal, if you're a Trinitarian. Uh, If God refers to the Father, you can say the Father sent his Son, but the Son did not send his Son. So there's a difference between the two that shows that they can't be numerically the same thing. You can quibble about whether these differences are in time or in eternity. You're going to find differences in time or in eternity, whatever your view about God and time is. Some people think divinity implies being strictly timeless. Other people think being divine implies existing at all times. Either way, there are going to be differences between the two. Whether you're a Trinitarian or Unitarian, there are going to be differences between the two. And so it seems to me that Just the New Testament and just Christian thinking, Christian theology generally are going to give you plenty of instances that show that my premise for is true. So this is what McManus writes. He quotes me. He says, here's what Tuggy says about premise four. Four is straightforwardly implied by many passages in the New Testament. Just off the top of my head, for example, the son was sent by God to save the world, but God wasn't so sent. At Gethsemane, God wanted the Son to be crucified, but the Son didn't want himself to be crucified. The Son is the mediator between God and humankind, but God isn't the mediator between God and humankind. McManus writes, I get the intuitive pull of these New Testament claims, but thanks to the two natures doctrine, the oneness Pentecostal is going to show that there's a logically possible way out here and just bite the bullet about how odd it sounds to us. I'll only address each of the truths Tuggy mentions above. So then he goes through them one by one. With regard to the sending of the Son, David Bernard says, so now he's quoting a leading oneness Pentecostal theologian. He says, The word sent does not imply pre-existence of the Son or pre-existence of the man. John 1.6 states that John the Baptist was a man sent from God, and we know that he did not pre-exist his conception. Indeed, the word sent indicates that God appointed the Son for a special purpose. God formed a plan, put flesh on that plan, and then put that plan into operation. Interesting quote. I agree with most of it, but I don't think we understand the last part the same way. When he talks about putting flesh on a plan, he thinks that's God himself. And I would say, no, that's just God's word expressed through the man Jesus. But anyway, McManus continues, if Bernard is right about what sent means, he might accept these truth conditions. So he gives these definitions, sent in and unsent in. Sent in. A subject S is sent if and only if S has a nature that is appointed for a special purpose. Unsent N is a subject S is not sent if and only if S does not have a nature that is appointed for a special purpose. Christ's human nature is appointed for a special purpose, but his divine nature is not so appointed. This seems like an odd way to speak, of course, because we ordinarily think that persons rather than their natures are appointed for specific purposes. This may sound odd if a concrete view of natures is in play here, but it isn't obviously contradictory, to me at least. 
So he's denying that the son was sent, but God wasn't sent. He's saying God, that is to say the son slash father, that same one was sent because he has a nature that was sent. I'm not sure why we'd accept that definition. I mean, being sent is when a person or a self receives a commission, uh, a mission from another, right? To act on behalf of that other self, that other person. I mean, being sent, if you say, well, actually, strictly speaking, it's the nature, the human nature that was sent. I mean, I think it follows that that sent human nature is a self that can have plans and knowledge and follow directions and carry out a mission faithfully. So, yeah, the oneness person is going to say that God sent himself, I guess. Of course, that's not exactly sending or appointing. It's something like sending or appointing, right? It's just basically coming oneself in disguise. It's only sort of apparent appointing, I would think. But the move to say that to be sent is to have a nature that's sent, I don't see why anybody would accept that other than just as a purely ad hoc way to save the coherence of one's Christology and theology. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Mr. McManish tries to show how a oneness Pentecostal could deny the second and third differences that I alleged between God and Jesus. McManus continues, What about wanting the Son to be crucified? I think that oneness Pentecostals are committed to the view that Christ has two minds and two wills. That said, I suggest the following. He calls these definitions WN and NWN. WN is a subject S wills that P, if and only if S has a nature in virtue of which S wills P. And NWN A subject wills that not P, if and only if S has a nature in virtue of which S wills not P. Uh, I don't think you really need two different definitions there. You're saying that to say that someone wills something should apply to that person only if they have a nature because of which they will it. It doesn't matter whether the thing willed is positive or negative. I think you only need one definition there. But the old idea here is that because this is a complete human nature that the word assumes, the human nature will come with a human mind and a human will, and the divine nature already has a divine mind and a divine will, and so you get two sets of both faculties or both powers, a divine thinking power and a human thinking power, divine will and a human will, and so then this is going to help you supposedly get around this example that Gethsemane, God wants the son to be crucified, and at that same time, Jesus doesn't want to be crucified. That's why he's asking if he can be excused, although he's willing to submit to it. But if it's God's will, he would like to not do this, please, which is a very reasonable request. So McManus writes, but Christ has a complete concrete human nature. He has a human soul and body. The human soul arguably comes ready set with a mind and will. So Christ has a human will, If you're worried about Nestorianism here, see footnote 23 of this paper of mine. But Christ also has a divine nature with a will, and hence can will by virtue of that nature. So, Christ can will to be crucified by virtue of his human nature, and will not to be crucified by virtue of his divine nature. I would add that this can be the case only if Christ is not conscious in his human mind that he just is the Father. Um, okay, again, I think the second definition is unneeded. You and I, just with our one mind and our one will, we very frequently will incompatible things. If you offer me chocolate cake, I will to eat it because, that is, I desire to eat it because it is going to be delicious, I believe. And yet, I also will not to eat it because I think that I've been eating too many sweets lately and I really should cut back. So, I'm tempted, I'm torn, 
in that circumstance where I'm tempted, I am willing incompatible things. I, of course, can't do both of those things. And unless I'm super confused, I can't choose both of those things. But there's nothing unusual about willing incompatible things, that is, desiring incompatible things. So, for instance, someone like me, who's a biblical Unitarian, believes that Jesus is a man. We have no problem with this scenario because Christ wants to be crucified because he thinks that at that moment, that's the Father's will for him, and he always wants to do what his Father wills for him. At the same time, Christ wills to not be crucified because... It's horrible to be crucified, and he knows this. And so he asks, can I be excused, please? But of course, if this is your immovable will, then I will willingly go along with it. So it's a case of willing incompatible things. It doesn't require two minds or natures or two wills or anything. So in my post, I say, at Gethsemane, God wanted the son to be crucified, but the son didn't want himself to be crucified Notice that's not willing incompatible things, that's willing a certain thing and also not willing that same thing. And that seems impossible. You can't at one time will a thing and also not be willing that same thing in the same sense. So McManus writes, Christ can will to be crucified by virtue of his human nature and will not to be crucified by virtue of his divine nature. Uh, I think he got that backwards. I think he means to say Christ can will to be crucified by virtue of his divine nature and will not to be crucified by his human nature. Well, again, you can will incompatible things. It's just that you can't will a certain thing and also not will that same thing. So I think what he wants to say is that at this moment, God wants the son to be crucified. And because of his human nature, the son doesn't want to be crucified. But because of his divine nature, the son does want to be crucified. I mean, I assume that's what he means in virtue of that still looks like a contradiction. If you will something in virtue of having a nature, then it looks like you just do will it, right? So if you're saying it's because of his divine nature that Christ wills to be crucified, but not because of his human nature, well, he does will it. Okay, but in the scenario in scripture, he doesn't will it. So that doesn't seem to help. Now, if he wants to say, well, strictly to will something is to have a nature which wills it, That's not what was in his definition, but if he switches to that, a subject S wills something, if and only if that subject has a nature that wills it, then he can say that Christ wills to be crucified, and that also Christ wills not to be crucified, and really it's the divine nature that wills for Christ to be crucified, and it's the human nature that wills that he should avoid crucifixion. Yeah, that would get around the problem that is a coherent picture. I'm not sure it really fits with scripture. And again, notice the cost. Uh, A willer and presumably a chooser and actor here is now a nature. And so it looks like the nature is a self. He tries to avoid this by saying, well, it's actually the one self working through a nature. I don't really know what that means. I know what it is to will something. I really don't know what it is to will something through a nature, unless that just entails willing something. So yeah, there's some messiness with this one, but again, I would just point out the consequence of the two concrete natures view. Um, It looks like you're going to be forced to say that they are doing things that only persons or selves can do. I I don't care what you call it, whether you call it Nestorianism or not, it seems like it's an unacceptable view with respect to the New Testament. Okay, so the third difference I said there was between God and Jesus in the New Testament, Mr. McManus writes, Finally, we have the issue of the Son as mediator. A mediator is a sort of go-between, or a thing that, say, brings information from an interested party over here to another interested party over there. In his recent debate with Dr. Michael Brown, Tuggy seems to think, based off a cross-examination question he proffers, that mediation requires three selves, the one mediated to, the mediator, and the one mediated from. Yeah, a couple points in response to this. Mediation does typically involve information exchange, but I think what's really essential to mediation is the negotiation. And a mediator, I claim, has to be a third party. It can't be the same as one of the two or more parties for which he is mediating. So I agree that mediation requires at least three selves. Now, there's a complication here, and 
Chris Date and I get into this in our forthcoming debate book. The complication is that the parties in a mediation can be not individual selves, but groups of selves. And so you can have two groups and a mediator between them. And in fact, the mediator might even be a member of one of the groups, but the point still holds. So if you're just mediating individuals, the mediator can't be either individual. He can't be the same individual that's on one side or the other. Otherwise, it wouldn't be mediation. It would just be one side dealing directly with the other. If you have a group on one or both sides, it's more complicated, but still the party has to be not identical to the self that's a mediator. He can't be just one or the other party, whether that's a group or a single individual. So yeah, you have to have at least three selves to have mediation. It's not just about information exchange, but it's about negotiation on behalf of, I think, interaction on behalf of. The mediator could be an agent of one side or the other, or he could be neutral, but he's acting as a go-between in the interactions is the point. Okay. McManus writes, Now, I'll be honest, I think there are claims in the New Testament that imply the Son and the Father are two persons. For example, I think that this is implied by the Deuteronomic two witness laws, which Jesus quotes and applies to himself and the Father in John 8, 17, and 18. Excellent point, I would say. I think that's a pretty devastating argument for any one self theology, such as a oneness view about the Father and Son. He continues, Yet I don't think mediation requires that the Son and the Father are numerically distinct, like qualifying as two Deuteronomic witnesses does. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Mr. McManus tries to explain Christ as mediator between God and humans in a way friendly to oneness Pentecostal views. Mr. McManus writes, I'm all for arguments that show the Son and the Father must be numerically distinct persons, but I'm not convinced we can get there through the concept of mediation. At bottom, I think this because revised truth conditions with the has nature such that, or by virtue of which locution, don't get oneness Pentecostals out of John 8, 17, and 18. More on this some other time. But it does seem to get them out of there being multiple persons in a mediation context. I suggest the following. And he has definitions he calls MN and NMN. A subject S mediates if and only if S has a nature in virtue of which S is a go between for two parties. An MN, a subject S does not mediate if and only if S has a nature in virtue of which S is not a go between for two parties. Like the other revised truth conditions, it should be clear that as a two natured subject, Jesus can be both a mediator and not be a mediator. I'll want to hear more from Tuggy about what's objectionable about MN and NMN. He should have a sufficient imagination to know that mediation doesn't logically require three selves. For example, take Sully in James Cameron's Avatar to be the only human left on Pandora. And the Navi, those are the stupid blue aliens, the Navi try to go after him. The Navi don't realize he's the only human left. Sully does his Avatar thing and acts through a complete Navi nature to be a mediator between himself and the Navi. A peace treaty is signed by both parties, and crisis is averted. What about this scenario logically requires three selves? Now, my answer to that is, nothing about that scenario logically requires three selves, and also, it's obviously not a case of mediation. If you remember the movie... Uh, When someone does the avatar thing, they get into this coffin-like structure, and then somehow there's this kind of dummy that they sort of can inhabit remotely and interact through. It makes them look like they're a member of this alien species. They can interact with members of the alien species, and they think that they're interacting with one of their own, but they're really just interacting with this puppet kind of thing, which is controlled by the person laying in the coffin thing who's hooked up to some neato computer. Right, so there is no mediator there. 
you might have fooled the Navi into thinking there was a mediator there because they don't realize that when they're talking to this puppet avatar thing, they're just talking to the guy. Okay, but then there is no person who's serving in a mediatory role. So we don't really think it's mediation. If the aliens did not realize what was going on, they might mistake it for a case of mediation, but that doesn't make it a case of mediation. So he wants to say that Christ is and isn't a mediator. So I guess you'd want to say he's not a mediator because he's just God himself, but he is a mediator because, well, the New Testament says that. And again, he makes a move kind of like Paul's, and he says, you mediate if and only if you have a nature in virtue of which you're a go-between for two parties, and you don't mediate if you have a nature in virtue of which you're not a go-between between two parties. And um, look, I don't know why you would accept this redefinition of the term mediation. You're a mediator, or you're said to mediate just in case you serve in a certain role. If you have a nature that serves in a role or not, I don't see why that would make you a mediator or not. So if we ask if you're a mediator, we're expecting yes or no. If you change the subject now and tell me about what the natures are doing, I don't think that you've answered my original question. And again, it looks like the natures are selves. You've got one that's serving as a go-between, and you have one that isn't serving as a go-between. And so because you have both of those as parts or something like parts, we'll say that you're a mediator and that you're not. Uh, Mr. McManus, I think, is trying to avoid that implication that the natures are selves that could do things like mediate. So what he does is he says, a uh, subject mediates if and only if they have a nature in virtue of which that person serves as a go-between for two parties. Okay, but look, if you have a nature in virtue of which you are a go-between, it follows that you are a go-between or a mediator. And if you have a nature in virtue of which you're not a go-between for those same parties, then you're not a mediator for those two parties. So I think his definitions are not good here. If you are a certain way because of a nature, then you just are that way. Let me compare this to another issue in Two Natures Christology, which is the omniscience issue. Everybody thinks, right, that God knows everything that can be known, knows everything that's true. Yet Jesus says at a certain point that he doesn't know the day or hour of his future return. Okay, so he's not divine, right? He's not God because he's not divine. He's no, no, two natures. Okay, but how does that work? How does this supposedly solve the problem? If you say, well, he has one nature in virtue of which he knows all, and he has another nature in virtue of which he doesn't know all. Okay, but if you're a certain way because of having a nature, you are that way. So you've just said that he does and doesn't know all. That's just a fail. The appeal to two natures is not helping you there. If you say because of the divine nature, this one person has complete knowledge, because of his human nature, the same person has limited knowledge, you've just said that one and the same being has complete knowledge and also limited knowledge, which is to say doesn't have complete knowledge. So the contradiction just comes right back up and knocks you down. Now, what you can do to get around this, and I take it this is basically what Dr. Paul is doing, is you can say, actually, you know, it is the natures that are the subjects of knowledge, whether it's limited or complete. He wants to say that Christ, the one person here in the incarnation, is all-knowing and yet limited in knowledge. And so he defines all-knowing as has a nature that's all-knowing, and he defines limited knowledge as having a nature that's limited in knowledge. So does this make sense? I mean, it makes sense to say that there's one self that knows all, and there's another self, and this one doesn't know all, but has very limited perspective, limited knowledge. Yes, that makes sense. But what we asked originally was, is Christ all-knowing or not? It seems to me that Dr. Paul is just switching the topic here, switching the subject to talking about these nature things. And uh, he can't say that whatever's true of the nature applies to the whole person, because if he said that, then the problem would just pop right up again. There'd be a contradiction again. But I don't think I've yet been told whether Christ, the composite person, is all-knowing. You say, well, I'll call him all-knowing because he's got this divine nature, and I'll call him limited knowledge because of this human nature. That's nice. But I wasn't asking about what you would call him. I was asking about whether, on your view, this composite person knows everything, or whether that's false on your view. I want to know if that's true or false. 
I think that question's been dodged and not answered by Paul's strategy understood in that way. So what's objectionable about Mr. McManus's definitions, NMN, NMN? Again, they are a subject S mediates if and only if S has a nature in virtue of which S is a go-between for two parties. What's objectionable is the has a nature in virtue of which seems to be totally unneeded. Why shouldn't it just be S mediates if and only if S is a go-between for two parties? That sounds something like an analysis of the concept of mediation or something like a definition of the phrase S mediates. Of course, it doesn't have to be two parties. It could be three or more parties. But anyway, we get the general idea. So, I mean, it looks like we've slapped on that nature part just again to save a theory. That seems to be the only motivation for it. And because it looks like having a feature in virtue of a nature implies having that feature, it looks like with his definitions, he will be saying that Christ mediates between humans and God, and also Christ doesn't mediate between humans and God. So he does and he doesn't, but that seems like a contradiction. Yeah, that doesn't seem like we're getting anywhere if we're trying to come up with a coherent Christology. And to finish up his article, he says, As for Tuggy's justification for premise four, we've seen that on the revised truth conditions I've offered, there's no reason to think something is true of the Father that isn't true of the Son. That is, if the oneness Pentecostal accepts the following. First of all, the revised truth conditions. Second, a concrete view of Christ's human nature. And third, that the Father is a composite person and hence just is the Son subsequent to the Incarnation. If somebody is collapsing the Father and Son so that the one just is the other, they're probably just going to embrace the consequence that therefore there can't be any difference between the Father and the Son. But just reading the New Testament, they're going to pile up all these apparent differences. And so the more differences seem to be assumed there, the more costly you realize that this move is. Right? So the Father's crucified, the Father dies. You end up with the Son saying to himself, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. The Son says that he gets his mission and his knowledge from the Father. Well, it turns out he really just gets it from himself because he is the Father. I think it makes nonsense out of the New Testament idea that worship given to the Son goes to the Father. So when you worship the risen and exalted Son, it's to the glory of the Father. I mean, if they're really just the same person, there is no immediate and then ultimate destination, if you could put it that way, for worship or honor. You don't worship God to the glory of any other. It's just, it goes to God, right? And so, again, this is another cost. They just, they can't think that there are really two objects of worship. That glory given to one goes to the, the one that sent and empowered the mission of the first one there. It just collapses into worshiping one and the same being who's sort of appearing in two different ways. Again, the exaltation of Jesus is a problem. Oneness theology bristles with problems. Also, one could accept this Model T idea and not really be a one-selfer with respect to the Trinity. You might think that there's this eternal Son, and in the Incarnation he gains a part, which is a complete human nature, and so now he exists with two parts. But you might think that this son is someone other than the father, that there really are two beings and two selves there. There's nothing about that that really requires a oneness or a oneself approach. Some people would hold to that sort of model of incarnation, and they could still be Unitarians. They could think the one true God is the father. However, there's this other being, this lesser divine being, the eternal logos or word, and this word gains a part as described in this Model T model. That's it for today. If you're a Oneness Pentecostal, let us know what you think about this argument. Love to hear more from Mr. McManus. I would wish him well and encourage him in his studies. He's obviously smart enough to be a professor of philosophy or theology. It's just a question of, does he actually want to do that? Does he want to go all the way through getting a PhD and everything that that involves? Maybe or maybe not, but he's already discoursing at a very high level. He's got a very interesting publication to his credit already. And he's writing blog posts that are very carefully argued and really fun to interact with. So thanks for the argument, Skylar, and let's continue the conversation if possible. 
This week's thinking music has been the track Self Deceived from the album Demonized by X Take Rux. I assume that's how you pronounce it. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org where you can listen to or download that entire track. If you love the Trinities podcast, please share this episode on social media like Twitter or Facebook and help other people to find the podcast by giving us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. You can also support the Trinities podcast by giving a certain donation per episode. If you're interested in that, please visit patreon.com slash trinities. Finally, let us know what you think. Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode or join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. The Trinities podcast is supported by and made for thinking believers like you. Thanks for your support, prayers, and encouragement. listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.